Gre right, greetings, Ferrelli Le 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 Legends attendees. Um, for those of you watching the stream from the other instances, you can go to the Ferality Online Discord and submit Q&A questions to the Silas Sable Q&A. It should be under the event discussion list of channels. And um, once we go through questions here um, with the audience, we'll pull questions from there. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to uh, part three of the Ask a Gray Muzzle Anything presentation. Uh, this is the third such event at Ferality, and this is Ferality Legends. This has been a great convention for me. I hope it's been fun for you, too. Uh, I'm Silas Sable. Uh, in the real world, you know, with a you know, the IRS and banks or whatever. My name is Mark Merlino. And for people who do know, uh, my partner Rod O'Reilly and I were the instigators of what became the furry fandom uh, by hosting uh, room parties at comic and science fiction conventions for a couple of years. And then eventually uh, deciding to start our own convention, uh, which was in 1989. It was called Conference Zero because it was sort of our practice con. And uh, we had 65 people attending, 100 registered, and two fursuits. And you can see footage of this on the archive page. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, I highly recommend watching the fandom documentary, which is up on YouTube for free. Uh, Ash Coyote, Chip Fox, and their team created this documentary. And um, it was released in July of 2020. And it's the first furry documentary that I know of that actually covers the history of the fandom, where it all came from. And um, it can answer a lot of questions, but what I like to do is I like to take questions from people um, and answer them with as much detail as I can come up with if there's something that I'm aware of. And basically, I will talk your ears off. And for volleys, of course, that takes twice as long. Um, so if there's anybody in the live audience that wants to ask a question to get the ball rolling, please uh, step up to the symbol on the, on, in front of the stage there and ask the question. Okay, it looks like... Oh, there's somebody. It's my mic working. Hello, Mallow Moore. Hello, Mallow Moore. Uh, it's Halo Moore, guys, but thanks. Anyways. Okay, and, so let me just uh, get this out of the way. I did not know you guys were around as long as I have been around. I thought you guys were like a 2010 thing. I'm kind of, you know, figuring out all this for myself. <laughs> but but my question is this. I was, the la I was at the last uh, panel, and... um. I asked um, a certain. I didn't. I couldn't ask this question because um, they were showing the goods of the this uh, um, community. And uh, my question is this: Okay, you've been around for a, well longer than me, obviously. <laughs> no offense, by the way. <laughs> but um, my question is this: What's the bad of this community? I, I need to know that because I've seen all the goods so far. But I want to know what's the what draw, oh, draws of this community. Like, it's like what what's the like what what gets all the hate for this cuz i heard you guys are hated a lot but so what's the um what's the bad part about this community i think most of the of the bad uh there are a small number of people uh who were in the community from the beginning who huh. were not comfortable having uh people with different orientations as a part of the fandom um oh and, 
Oh, uh, basically, they put a lot of effort into sabotaging conventions and convincing people that there was something wrong with uh, with uh, LGBT people being involved in the fandom. Um, as far as the outside's concerned, what these people would do is they would take a seed, just a little seed of information, like, okay, furry fans are fans of animal characters. Animal characters are generally not something that adults really are into. It's something that children are into. So if adults like animal characters, then they're probably pedophiles. Uh, uh, oh, okay. That's a big jump. Uh, and basically, you take a seed like this, and if you're trying to disrupt the fandom, which really isn't organized. The fandom is not organized. There is no national furry club. It's just a bunch of individuals who like the same thing. And then there are people who organize furry meets. There are people who organize conventions. Those are the insane ones. Um, and basically gatherings of people who on their own have this hobby or interest that they probably were born with. Uh, so basically, you spread the misunderstanding. And in general, this doesn't get out to the general public. The general public doesn't really know we exist or any kind of fan groups exist. But there's always this loud group of people. Originally, they were on the pre internet uh, communication services. And they would spam Usenet and things like that with lies and misconceptions about the fandom. And, and so for people who wanted to get into the fandom, finding out about this, it scared them. It actually scared them away. So I don't want to be in that group if it's that hated. But you have to remember, the group wasn't that big then. And the people doing all the hating were tiny. It was a tiny group of people. Just using the pre-internet and eventually the internet megaphone to sound much louder, like there was more of them than there actually are. Then, of course, you've got the situation where if you've got social media, there's these little clubs that form kind of automatically of people who find kinship in hating the same thing. So they go, you know, I hate furries. And someone goes, oh, if I hate furries too, can I be in your group? And you end up with this situation where people are basically trying to get attention. And some people realize a good way to get attention instead of liking something is to hate it. So that's where most of that comes from. As far as the media representation of the fandom, in Hollywood, uh, there was an amateur filmmaker who was very big in the kink community. And he thought that furries were another kind of kink, dressing up in animal costumes. So he okay. made a film. And he got some people to interview. He went to our convention, got some people to interview um, who just happened to be in the kink community, too. And he presented this film as an amateur film. It made the amateur film circuit. It's still around. You can watch it if you want to. It's called Furries and Plushies. And, of course, other people in Hollywood saw this and said, oh. This is a group that we can put, we can write into our stories to make them interesting. The thing is, is the people who he interviewed for his movie were basically having him on. They were basically playing with him. They figured out what he wanted, and they basically made up stuff to tell him, which he then filmed. 
And once the film got out, even though it's pretty obscure, people in Hollywood writing scripts for other shows or doing uh, um I mean, was it MTV had a had a uh, reality show? They called it, and they would inter- they went out to interview someone who was a who was a young fur, and then they wrote the story to make it look like it was all about kink. So you pile all this together, and that's where the bad side of furry. I'm sorry, where the bad side of furry came from. Now, of course, within the community, one of the things about the furry fandom that's different from most fandoms is it's extremely personal. People take it very personally. We have our fursonas. We are furries. Besides liking furries, we are furries. And a lot of people enter the community and they say it's very comfortable and everybody's your friend. This unfortunately sets it up for the few predators who can give the community a bad name because they're basically using the fact that furries enter the community thinking, oh, here I can trust everybody because everybody's a furry and I'll be safe with everybody. This isn't true. There are some bad apples there. As and most places. they use the, the gathering, they use the community as a way to pick targets. So this is where the community has to do its own policing to make sure these people don't hurt anybody. Of course, once again with social media, you get these people coming online and they have a grudge against somebody. They'll make stuff up. So it's, you know, if you're going to follow Twitter, for example, everything you see, every, every storm of controversy you see, before you jump in, you should check it out. Where does it come from? Who's making this stuff up? Is it actually documentable? That's why I'm here. Yeah. So that's pretty much all of the bad things about the fandom that I know about from my personal experience and from the fact that I I do read Twitter and it's pretty shocking sometimes but it's amazing so, how much of these controversies go away quickly so it's mostly just slander I mean I know I mean obviously there's gonna be bad apples in a community so it's, oh, what you tell me is it's just mostly slander yeah, pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. Okay, well, I understand that. So, so overall, your community is like, I would say, welcoming? Is that the term I would use? Yeah, it's, it's yeah. very welcoming. Uh, a lot of the people, not everybody, but a lot of the people who enter the community are on the autism spectrum. Uh, they may not have had friends in school. They may have uh, had a, a rough family life or something like that, and they end up joining the community and discovering that it's a family. It's like a family. So it, it's interesting. When you, can, when you can present yourself as what you imagine yourself to be, it's a great way to introduce yourself to other people. All right, that answers my question. Thank you. All right, no, thank you for having me. I, th- I thought you guys wouldn't allow people like me, so. <laughs> no, pretty much everybody's welcome. <laughs> okay, all right, thank you very much. You're welcome. Anybody else in the live audience? Um, I know that it, it things kind of got confusing in the beginning there, so probably a lot of people didn't know about it. Anybody else here in the room? Get a question. Um, otherwise, we can go to our um, questions in the Q and A. 
Anybody? Has anything shown up on the Discord yet? Uh... Yes. Yeah, we've we've got a lot of a lot of questions here. So. Okay. Um. Well. Yeah, so the first one uh, from Masterfury X um, asks, Sai, how do you feel if there would be a sequel to the fandom documentary? Or what's, what's your take on there being a sequel? That would be interesting to do. I know that uh, Ash had talked about doing something that's a little more international about the fandom in other countries. Um, but she is a filmmaker, and she's working on other projects right now uh, that, you know, are super important to her, which is, that you know, that makes sense. But um, it would probably be a lot more like the other documentaries that have been made so far, which is about who furries are and what they do. It, you know, because they pretty much nailed the history down pretty well, the early history. So I, you know, I'd be welcome. I, I wouldn't mind being involved in something like that um, if, if it ever happens. Thank you for the question. Answer. All right, uh, next question. Steamy asks, what was it like growing up as a furry while the furry fandom was so small, or perhaps when the furry fandom wasn't around, so to say. That was interesting because um, I actually had, my parents actually told me uh, some things about me when I was a child, uh, that I was pretty much obsessed with animation. And the animation that I liked was the kind that had animal characters in it. Um, and that was from when I was still small and sitting on my mother's knee, going to the movies with my father. There's a cute little animation in the, in the documentary about this, but according to them, it actually happened. They took me to the movies. They used to take me to the movies because they couldn't get a babysitter. And the theater was on the Navy base where my dad was stationed. And they always had first run movies and they would go to the movies and I couldn't stand it. I, I hated being in the dark and, you know, I'd squirm and, and, and fuss and cry and make, make their lives miserable. And then one time they went to see Bambi and the film started up and I looked at the screen and I completely shut up for the whole movie and just stared at the screen. And my parents told me this, and I go, wow, that's interesting. Told me this much later. <laughs> um, so, you know, it wasn't... I don't know if they thought that my interest in this was strange. Because, you know, when I wanted to buy comics, back then you bought comics at the supermarket or the drugstore. There were no comic stores. You go to comic... And I'd buy comics, and I'd pick out the ones I'd like, and they were always, you know, Woody Woodpecker, uh, Warner Brothers, you know, The Roadrunner, things like that. I was always into birds, apparently, um, when I was that young. And um, when I grew up, when I was going through high school, I would spend hours at Disneyland and the Art of Animation exhibit looking at the, the artwork. And how animated films were made. Uh, whenever they were on television, we didn't have any VCRs then. You know, we had to wait for the shows to come along that we liked. Uh, I know I really loved uh, uh, a movie by UPA, not Disney, but an animated film by the studio called United uh, United Producers Associates called Gay Paris which was a musical uh, with cats in Paris. And uh, I loved it. It was wonderful. And I hadn't even realized at the time that anybody made animated features except Disney. So I kind of became a huge fan of that movie that nobody else seemed to know existed. It was on TV. 
Uh, but I'd never seen it in the theaters. I didn't know it was around. So that's pretty much, you know, I grew up with that interest constantly. Uh, I didn't go into animation. I didn't go into art. I went into engineering. That That's my first love. Um, but when I was in high school, I dreamed up these critters called skilled hair because I watched Star Trek and other science fiction shows and movies and wondered why all the aliens looked like humans. You know, they might have had a lot of makeup, but they were still human. And I had gotten really into otters and the other weasel family animals because in school, whenever recess would be rained out, they'd drag out the projector and we'd all sit in the cafeteria and watch movies. And a lot of the movies we got to watch were Disney films. And one of them was a true-to-life adventure nature film called Beaver Valley. But it had lots of otters in it. And I thought the otters were amazing because here's these wild animals that do all this playing all the time. Which I thought was, I don't, you know, humans play. I didn't know wild animals played. And that really intrigued me. So I took this interest. And when I was in high school in art class, I was basically painting and drawing otters and other weasel characters. Uh, and I came up with the idea of, oh, I'm going to make an alien, an intelligent alien for another planet that's not a human. And I came up with the skill tear, which uh, this is an aquatic skill tear, which is an otter based alien animal. There's also pine marten based animals, two different kinds of skill tear, aquatic and arboreal. Um, differences is where they hunt for their food. They're actually the same species. But I wrote stories in my head and wrote some of them down. And, you know, nobody challenged me on it. Some of the people I ran into in the science fiction club loved my stories and liked the skill tear so much that when somebody in the club decided to publish their own science fiction role-playing game in tabletop game, they approached me and said, can we put the skill tear in our game as a playable race? And that game is called Other Sons. And it was put out by a company that was trying to compete with the popular space game called Traveler. But unlike Traveler, that had a couple of sort of animal species, Other Sons had humans and then several other animal species from different planets involved in kind of a federation. So by the time I met Rodney, and I met Rodney because of skill tear, uh, basically, I was in the local science fiction club. He was taking his science fiction fan club from school to a science fiction convention in Anaheim, and I had some of my art in the art show. I was running the video room, which was a video screening room. I showed old science fiction movies um, and uh, a little bit of anime that we had that people liked, uh, a lot of giant robot stuff. And he went to the art show, and his friend goes, did you see this art, Rodney? Because you like weasel characters. Did you see this art over here with these... Colorful weasel characters with antenna. And Rodney goes, oh, wow, that's great. I wonder who made that art. And he asked around, and the guy said, oh, he's the guy running the video room. So Rodney came in and said, I want to ask you why your pine martens and otters have antennas. And I said, wow, you recognize that they're not cats and dogs. You recognize they're pine martens and otters. That's amazing. Most people don't even know. 
So he said, why do they have antennas? And I said, well, sit down and I'll tell you about them. And that's how we met. So we were already in fandom. We were in science fiction fandom. We went to a lot of con. And then some very good friends of ours said, we have a room in the hotel that we're not using at night. Why don't you throw a party? And we said, okay, uh, both room parties have kind of a theme. What would we do? And they go, well, you got that really cool Animal Olympics TV special and your Warner Brothers cartoons on tape. Why don't you show those and bring all that, that interesting animal art you've got and have kind of like a little artist gathering for people like animation. So we called the party the Prancing Skill Tear Party, which was the name of our house. And a lot of people showed up at the party, looked around at the art on the bed and the illustrated books we'd brought, watched Animal Olympics, and then reached into their bag and pulled out a sketchbook and said, I thought I was the only person who drew these kind of animals. And from then on, we kept having parties at every convention we went to, and we found more and more people that liked the same kind of animal characters we did, whether they were based on Disney, Warner Brothers, or even underground comics. We found there were more people out there that liked this stuff. So at one of these parties, um, our friend Carl said, hey, Everybody, give me your contact information. I'm going to start a newsletter, a little fan newsletter that I can bring to all the furry parties and pass out to people. And that became the first furry zine, furry fanzine. So we were paralleling science fiction fandom. We had an interest that we shared. It was mainly art-based, but there were some people writing stories. Then someone came along and said, I want to publish this stuff. And they started making a magazine. And then after several years of furry parties, Rodney said, hey, the anime fans are starting their own conventions. The anime fans used to come to science fiction conventions, and they'd show anime in screening rooms. Science fiction conventions said, hey, hey, wait a minute. We're not a film convention, so, so why don't you guys start your own conventions? So they said, fine. And all of a sudden, we had an anime convention in San Francisco. It was the first one. And Rodney said, so do you think it's time we have our own convention? And I said, yeah, let's try it. And that was basically um, Confort Zero. So it came completely around to that. I know that a lot of people who are, who are young furries, living with their parents, with their family, going to high school and things like that, have it hard because they have this interest that they really want to express. And people just don't understand it for a lot of the reasons I mentioned before. Um, I guess I'm lucky. I never had a problem, and neither did Rodney, uh, with his family or, or in school or anything about his interests. I hope I answered the question there in the very roundabout way. <laughs> I've never heard anyone else talk about a uh, gay parade, so that was that was nice to hear. Um, ah. question from question from Silverfields. Do you have any new thoughts or observations regarding online con regarding online conventions and social VR spaces since the last virality? Or if it's not a question you've been asked, maybe thoughts or observations on online convention and social VR spaces in general. Yes, the first uh, online convention I attended was a 
combination furry and brony con called RamCon. And it was on, it happened almost completely on Discord with some YouTube streaming for some of the events. And this was in 2020, and I thought, well, this is a really great idea. I hadn't actually gotten back on VR chat. I'd been on VR chat a few years before, and it was very primitive, very crude, and everybody that I ran into was very rude and didn't like furries. Or at least that's the opinion that I got from them. Uh, essentially, it was just a lot of very young people trying to be edgy. So I hadn't been back. But I went to this virtual con. They had Everybody had a channel. All the dealers had their own Discord channel that you could go to and see what their stuff was for sale. Some of them had web page links and things like that. And I thought, well, this is a great way to have conventions during the pandemic. So. Uh, my, my partner, Changa, gave me his Rift S to try out. And so I got back on VR chat in his Rift S. I'd been on desktop before. It was a lot better experience. And I started meeting furries and going, oh, the furries are here now. This is great. And a little while after that was the first plurality. And I got into the whole thing late. I wasn't able to get a membership. But I did go on Twitch and watch a lot of the panels that happened. I thought, this is cool. So after that, I kept looking for virtual furry cons. A lot of them were on VR chat because very industrious and clever people would duplicate the venues of the real life conventions and then open them up. And then they would have a they would pick a weekend and say, This is our convention weekend and you know, come and hang out with your friends and we're gonna have you know panels on YouTube and Twitch and stuff like that. But when the second ferality came along, I go, Okay, now I now I know about it. I quickly got a membership and discovered hey, this is actually like a real con. It's not in a public space. There's not people wandering through, messing things up. The events actually happen in VR, and you can attend them. And the dealers have actual dealer's room with booths. It's just like a real convention. And I thought this... You know, we're during we're in a pandemic, but what's cool about this convention is that people who don't normally go to conventions because they might be nervous about being in public with people they don't know, or they might live far away and can't afford the travel or can't afford the hotel room, they can come to this convention wherever they are. And I met people from all over the world at Ferality. And I had my presentation, which went over very well. And I thought, this is kind of the future. I don't know if it's going to replace live conventions, but I think as far as accomplishing the same thing that a gathering like a convention does, it's almost the same. It, it's very much a similar experience. Except everybody has a fursuit and has lousy side vision instead of just some people. So I think this is going to keep going. Uh, Ferality has obviously got, got it down. There are still some problems between the interfacing between Discord and the website and VR chat. Uh, there's, you know, crashes. People have to have a good internet connection to be able to, to attend. But I think it's going to keep happening. Live conventions have started again, and I've been to two of them. I've been to Denver and uh, BLFC. 
I drove to both of them because I'm still a little bit nervous about airlines and the pandemic. Um, and I re there is, what is I remember? There is wonderful as I remember them to being, and I think they're going to get bigger again. But in 2019, before it all went down, uh, Midwest Fur Fest had their 20th anniversary convention. And I got all my, my three mates together and said, we're going to go to this convention. Even though we have to fly there, we're going to go to this convention because it's very large. And we can see so many people we know. And it'll be just great. And we went, and it was fantastic. And of course, because of COVID, that convention, the 2019 Midwest Fur Fest, was the largest furry convention in history. There's never been a bigger furry convention. And until we get over this pandemic or learn how to live with it, there'll never be one that big again. And I thought, when we got there Thursday night and we walked into the lobby, the Hilton, the, the Hyatt lobby is like four story atrium, open lobby. There were probably 2,000 furries just in the lobby hanging out, which is as big as most average furry conventions are. And that was just the lobby of MFF. It turned out they don't brag about their attendance, but I was able to talk to some people who worked in registration. There were 12,000 people there. So that's how many go to a large furry convention when there's no pandemic on. And I think that's cool. But it didn't feel... And nothing felt bad about it. Nothing felt like this is too big or anything, at least to us. So when people say, what's the difference between furry fandom in the 1990s and furry fandom, you know, in, in the 2020s, I go, well, in the early days, you got to hang out with, you know, a hundred of your closest friends. And nowadays you get to hang out with 12,000 of your closest friends. I hope I touched on your question there somewhere. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, I'm going to jump around. There's so many good questions. Uh, Vicket on the channel asks, what do you miss most about the old fandom? I'm sorry, what? What do you miss most about the old fandom? Oh! Wow, that's interesting. I think one of the things that Rodney mentioned was that for the first four years, we knew everybody who came to the convention, either through correspondence, seeing them at science fiction conventions, comic conventions. We knew everybody almost personally. And after for the fourth year, that started to change. We started having a lot of people show up. We didn't know who they were. They didn't know who we were, but they were having a good time, which is why we did it. So I kind of missed that. Um, there are artists that have unfortunately passed on or have health issues and don't produce a lot of art anymore and i love those artists i love what they put out and i kind of miss their work um there is a lot of furry art now but some of these artists had a style and used techniques that modern artists aren't using so i miss that that kind of art um Otherwise, I think that's about it. I mean, you talk about the controversy and, you know, the the online hate and stuff. That was there from the very beginning. There really wasn't a time, except for the first two furry conventions, 
where we didn't have issues with people trying to mess things up for us. So, you know, same as, same as. It's like, you know, you're going to be in the furry community. You have to deal with that. All righty. Uh, you sort of touched on the growth after the fires. Cheshire02, or 02, asks, what is your opinion on the growth of the fandom? And did you ever think it would be as large as it is today? Well, I could kind of compare it to science fiction fandom, which never got quite this big uh, convention-wise. Uh, there were a lot of science fiction fans. I mean, we're talking about science fiction fans that read science fiction, not science fiction fans of Star Trek and Star Wars. Literary science fiction conventions were the first fan conventions ever, and they started in the 1930s. And they were started by fans who were upset that people who wrote science fiction and fantasy were not considered real authors by the community, by the, by the literary community. And as we know now, some, some of these science fiction and fantasy authors are the greatest authors we've ever had. But back then, they were considered, it was considered if you write Anything in those genres, it's trash. So they started a fandom so they could support the authors. And then inside that fandom, new people came up as the next generation of authors. So that worked out really well. But those conventions were tiny compared to the conventions we have nowadays. Um, the biggest conventions are comic conventions. And comic conventions are actually nowadays me all media conventions. They're not just comics. They're television shows and movies, and there's huge promotions at them. And San Diego Comic-Con, before the pandemic, had 120,000 people show up. So um, I think furry fandom is interesting because the only people in furry fandom are furries. You don't have a lot of people in the fandom who aren't interested in animal characters nearly to the point of obsession. You don't see a lot of people joining the furry fandom who aren't already interested in animal characters and have been since they were born. So it is interesting to me to see that there's that many people in the world with this same strange affliction of loving animal characters. And it's pretty much universal. But I think we had the climate in the United States with all the other conventions happening, particularly the big media conventions, that we were able to collect more of them faster. But nowadays, we're having conventions in Europe with 6,000 people. So, yeah. And as far as the growth is concerned, there's a great model for the, for, for the growth on, at high speed, and that's the bronies, the My Little Pony Friendship is Magic fans. The show premiered on October 10th, 2010. It was part of an ongoing um, genre, you know, basically a marketing thing to sell little girls' toys. But that particular show, Friendship is Magic, had a lot bigger scope, a lot deeper writing, a lot more interesting characters, and we already had media fans out there waiting for the next big thing. That was it. So... In two years, they have BronyCon with 7,000 people showing up. So it was like the furry fandom accelerated because we had, you know, the fans of the show. Then suddenly there was fan art. Then there was original characters or pony sonas. Then there was 
adult art. Then there was story writing. There were people creating entire novels of crossover stuff like uh, the My Little Pony. Um, uh, uh, what is it? Um, I, I'm not a gamer and I only peripherally know about games with it. Uh, Fallout. Um, thousands and thousands of pages uh, have been written on the My Little Pony version of Fallout. Um, and published. You can actually buy the books online. Uh, so that was a glimpse of how a fandom can grow in this day and age with the internet that fast. And sadly, now that the show has ended, most of those pony conventions are gone now. The, the fandom just dropped right off. Uh, one of the things that'll keep furry fandom going is we're not a fan. We're not fans of a movie or TV show or comic book or novels. We're fans of anything that has animal characters in it, and we make our own. We make our own characters that are ourselves. We invent our own stories. And that'll keep happening as long as people are born with that interest. So, yeah, and it was a little surprising that there were that many people. But without the Internet, it wouldn't have happened. Ready. Uh, Dragnus on the Discord asks, what's something you think the furry fandom can improve upon from your perspective? That's, that's tricky. Um, it would be interesting if a lot of the petty fighting between creators or people complaining about creators would end because... You know, if you're a person who's creative, if you create art or write stories or whatever, um, it's not a popularity contest. If you actually know any artists in real life, you'll discover that artists draw for themselves. And some of them are able to then draw for other people for money or for gift art or whatever. But that's how artists communicate. That's how creative people communicate. And uh, it would be good if we would just let the creative people create and not be so critical. Uh, another thing would be good if there wouldn't be people stealing other people's, you know, creations or trying to steal other people's identity. Uh, the whole, you know, uh, desire to be a popufer, to be the one with the most followers. The, you know, the most followers on YouTube, the coolest fursuit, whatever. Um, that kind of celebrity doesn't really belong in a fandom. Um, and it's kind of a shame when it happens because it, in a lot of cases, it'll split the fandom. You have people going, well, I really support this popufer. And other people go, I don't support this popufer. And it's like you end up with arguments that have very little to do with the actual fandom. Um, as far as the problems we're having with um, people taking advantage of the kind of community we are, the family, you know, black sheep and the family. It would be good if that improved, but unfortunately right now we don't have a good way to do that. It's really, you know, we, nobody has dossiers on every furry fan. Um, we have to rely a lot on what are basically rumors, and it's really hard to track things down. But in general, the fandom is a pretty safe place for all kinds of people on every spectrum. Um, and hopefully, uh, you know, maybe with a little more control on social media, always remember all the social media platforms are private places. They are not public forums. They're owned by companies, and those companies have every right to censor anything they want 
because when you're on those platforms, you're on their territory. You're in their land. And furries should know about territory. So maybe if we have better monitoring of the forums people use, there'll be less likely bad information to be spread. I mean, with Rod and I, we fought 30 years of misinformation about our convention. And we had no idea why it was so prevalent, why it was being repeated, until people like Ash Coyote pointed out, oh, don't you realize what's going on? It's, it's homophobia. They're, they're, these are homophobes that are spreading all sorts of stupid rumors about you guys. And it's like, we never realized it. We didn't think people could be that low, could be that obsessed. And, you know, a good example of how that can be corrected. The other side of the problem was he had a few people who very much wanted furry fandom to start in 2000. They wanted to be right there for the start of the furry fandom. And since they had been active, running conventions and things like that before 2000, they decided what we have to do is we have to rewrite history and make anything furry before 2000 be a bad thing, be evil, be poorly organized, badly run, uh, craziness going on making a bad reputation for people. we got to make anything before 2000 disappear out of history so we can be the ones that started everything. And it's difficult to fight against stuff like that when there's so many rumors getting recycled over and over again. And what it took was Ash's film. You know, I'll remember that date forever, January 3rd, 2020. It's like, finally, something came along to fix it, to set it right. If that can happen, then other problems the fandom has can also be fixed. And hopefully, we'll figure out ways to do that. I jump around some more here. Uh, Lake Ski the Discord asks, as someone coming up to age 40, I often feel out of place around um, people in VR and others in the fandom who seem to mostly be in their fan, who mostly are in their 20s, and he worry that he's too old. Uh, how do you feel, how do you get around these sort of worries from your perspective? That's a good question because um, there's this uh, there's a group of people who are very active in the fandom. Um, some of them don't go to conventions, but they have friends in the fandom. They have partners in the fandom. Um, they're usually under twenty, and they are of the opinion that things like adult content. Uh, particularly adult content that leads in one or the other strange kinks, gives the fandom a bad name and should be banned from it. Uh, uh, the joke term for these people are puritines. One of the things I've seen come up a few times on Twitter, and you know, don't trust Twitter for good information. Don't ever trust Twitter for good information. Is people saying there should be a cutoff year? Nobody should should be in furry fandom over the age of thirty, because if anybody's in the fandom over the age of thirty, they're probably predators. They're probably just coming to conventions to groom youngsters, which is completely ludicrous. You got to realize that a lot of the people who are forty now maybe got in the fandom when they were eighteen. And the people who are 14 now, in 10 years, are going to be 24. 
in another 10 years, are they going to quit the fandom? I don't think so. Um, and yeah, it is a little bit strange. There is that generation gap where younger furs are into different things. Um, I mean, I see everywhere I see, you know, video games. Video games and computer games are everything to the current generation, even 30-year-olds. I see lots of posts about, you know, here's a picture I took. I found a box in the attic. This is my childhood, and it's a bunch of older computer games, maybe handheld games, you know, maybe Nintendo and things like that. Um, or I see posts going, you know, what were the first games you remember playing? And that's a whole generation of people who grew up with video games. I, I didn't have any of that. Um, when I was 15 years old, I was in the Explorer Scouts. And we were making computerized radio control robots and restoring a old Navy remote control submarine. That's my childhood. Um, but yeah, there's a disconnect. I mean, I'm on, I follow Reddit gaming just so I can keep up with the names of the popular games and what people are playing and what people are saying about them. Um, and unfortunately all the politics about game reviews shows up there too. But yeah, no, if you're 40 and you still have the interest, um, there's no reason why you can't be. I mean, I, I have a lot of people following me on Twitter, and I know that some of them are under 18. I have a not, you know, my, 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 uh, all my Twitter stuff is safe for work. Um, I've he seen people... Say what's well, really controversial. Some of these artists that are doing adult material are under 18. I don't know what you can do about that. They're artists, they're creators, they're going to create whatever they want. Um, but yeah, I don't think there's a ceiling to being a furry. Um, but yeah, it some it sometimes takes a bit to find a common ground between. Um, the younger generation, and it is, we've got like three generations now. We've got, you know, we've got the, the, you know, people who are teenagers in high school who are daring enough. I would have never paraded around with a tail on when I was in high school, but they're daring enough to be out, you know, furries, proud furries in high school. And then we've got the college age people. And then we've got the gray, gray muzzles like me. There's no reason why the fandom can't be inclusive for all of those ages. So, I don't know, talk to people. Listen to people. That's always my trick. My trick about making friends is to be an active listener. So, you see some people talking. Get into the conversation, not by jumping in and saying something. But by listening and being interested, actually interested in the conversation, the subject matter, and importantly, the people. Be interested in the people. And it's amazing how well that works. How well you'll find yourself kind of slipping in and being part of the group, regardless of your age. Thank you for the question. No more questions in Discord? Sorry, sorry. Um, let me... Yeah, my bad. A uh, Scaly Bloke and then Roth Ritter ask... Oh, Scaly Bloke! I, I, I was there for his DJ the set. That was great. 
Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, yeah he had asked first, uh, do you think the current state of the fandom aligns with what people were doing when you were involved in the fandom many years ago? Or uh, maybe how it compares and contrasts? I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. I'll turn up volume. Okay, oh, what was uh, that? Yeah, so the question was, do you think the current state of the fandom aligns with what people were doing when you were involved in the fandom many years ago? Oh! Yeah, actually, this is a question that comes up almost every, uh, every session. Um, I think so. I think that there are ways to appreciate um, animal characters, and there are ways to share that appreciation. Uh, art has changed because of the medium and the techniques, uh, and you know the internet's changed things. Communication, you know, who writes paper letters and mails them anymore? Nobody does that. Um, but, you know, furry fandom was all about, originally about images. It was all about the art. It was all about bringing these things to life so you could look at them. And this, all of this is art. This is all furry art. From the room to the avatars. And, you know, I go to the dances and, you know, we didn't have... Um, you know, our furry DJs were the old fashioned kind of DJs back in the back in the nineties that just, you know, played records or tapes. We didn't have a lot of fancy mixing equipment. That happened later. But you wouldn't be able to tell if you could get in a time machine and go back to say conference conference nine, for example, which was the biggest furry convention there had been with 1,400 attendees, you would see much the same thing that you would see if you went to Method Fur Fest, or Midwest Fur Fest, I mean, in 2019. Same sort of stuff happening. Uh, people in costumes, people with tails and ears, uh, people doing artwork, people buying artwork, um, panels about real animals, you know, from veterinarians, uh, panels. I mean, one thing you didn't see that much back then were the, the panels about being on the autism spectrum, uh, being LGBT, um, uh, being uh, a person of color or an indigenous person, there, there were indigenous people and people of color in the fandom back then too. Uh, and to my knowledge, there is no body trying to keep, you know, trying to exclude any groups from the fandom that I know of except for maybe alt furs, and they don't count. They're just the burn furs in a different outfit. And that whole issue died years ago. Um, so I don't think it's that different. It's why I say the joke about, you know, hanging out with 100 of your best friends or 12,000 of your best friends. It's kind of the same. Um, one thing I do see a lot of these days, which is a little bit disturbing, is I see a lot more um, uh, talk about alcohol, talk about drinking, especially on VR chat, and um, people going, yeah, you know, getting drunk is cool. Not being able to remember what happened the night before is really neat. Uh, you know, you can't really party unless you've got booze. And... That's completely okay for adult furries. But remember, a 20-year-old in the United States uh, is un it cannot legally drink. 
So if you're bragging about the only way to have fun at a party is be drinking, make sure you know who's in the room. Because we have lost furs. We, furs have died from alcohol poisoning. Furs have become alcoholics and hopefully are getting treated. That wasn't as big of a thing back in the early convention days because room parties weren't a big thing. Uh, trying to get a hotel to allow you to have people hosting parties with alcohol was nearly impossible to do back then. So you did have the adult furs, most of them out of science fiction and comic conventions, you know, comic fandoms that were furry, hanging out at the bar. That was completely fine. We had a rule when we had guests of honor. Um, we'd, we'd pay for their airfare, and we would pay for their rooms and memberships and give them a table, but we would not pay their bar tabs. <laughs> Because a lot of traditional fans, adult fans, were big drinkers, big social drinkers, especially at conventions. Uh, but I think that, um, yeah, I don't think it's changed that much. I mean, the internet changes everything. You have artists who, who never actually sell a, a, a physical piece of art that are making a living. It's all digital. They're sending people files. Um, that's really different. But furry art is still super important to the fandom. So that hasn't changed either. And the community and the idea of, you know, meeting somebody online, meeting somebody in VR chat, maybe hooking up in real life. That hasn't changed either. That was the way it was back then, too. Okay. So we've got time for about two more questions from the Q&A. Okay. So one here. Uh, Lorcian from Channel. Um, the do that documentary from last year um, no doubt helped a lot of people to take their first steps to find the fandom. Uh, he goes on, uh, Lorcian goes on to talk about how he appreciated the um, documentary and decided to join the fandom from that um, eight, mo eight months ago. And his question is, how do you feel about being an almost public representative of the fandom as a result? Yeah. Ha! Okay, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, as Rodney pointed out in the documentary, People did not know who we were at our own conventions because we put the conventions on for the attendees to have fun. And it didn't make any sense. I mean, at the opening ceremonies, we'd stand up and say, welcome to the convention. Um, you know, here is some things that are happening. At the closing ceremonies, we'd say, thank you for coming. See you next year. That's all people would see of us. I mean, the hotel knew who I was because I was the hotel liaison. The guests knew who Rodney was because he was in charge of guests. Uh, the art show people, people in the art show knew who the art director was. Uh, people in the dealer's room knew who the dealer's den director was. But for the most part, people were at the convention to meet each other, to hang out with each other, to have fun. Um... And there have been people in the fandom, even before the term popufer existed, who have tried and in some cases succeeded to some point to become the official spokesman of furry fandom. Um, once again, there is no international furry club. There's no president of furry. And I don't think there needs to be. So it's great now that my conventions are not considered horrible things. Um, that's wonderful because that is an affirmation 
of the hard work that all of my con staffs put on over the years and you know kind of happy to see all the people that had a great time when they came to our conventions but i i will talk about the fandom what i know about it from my personal experience i will speculate about the future i will friend people I can talk about, I have a lot of interests as people who've run into me on VR chat have found out. I have a lot of other interests besides furry, but I really don't want to be any kind of official spokesperson. I don't want to be, um, uh, you know, a president. I don't want to be, uh, you know, a guru. I don't want to be, you know, uh, a mentor. I mean, I'll help people who want to put a convention on. I'll tell them you're crazy, and then I'll give them suggestions. But <sighs> it's nice to be recognized, but that's enough. I don't have to go any further with that. I love doing these things, and I'll keep doing them. Rodney and I, when we go to live conventions, we do similar panels. Um. When we get Rodney set up with his VR rig, which we're going to do probably in Christmas, around Christmas time, then he can come to the panels too. Uh, and both of us can, can talk at you. But yeah, I, I love being recognized. I think that's nice. Um, uh, I think you know, we actually did. We actually did set out to start a fandom. We did do that. A lot of stuff that happened was luck and accident, but Rodney and I did start out purposely to find more people who liked what we liked. And some of those people were creators, and some of those people were just fans. They just liked the stuff. And we opened our doors, and we let them into our parties, too. And you know, I tell people you can't have a fandom without fans. So if 12,000 people go to a convention, how many creators are there? How many first hitters are there? How many DJs? How many authors? How many publishers? And the rest are just fans, and that's completely okay. It's completely okay to be just a fan. So, yeah, I'm happy to be recognized. I I, I appreciate it a lot. Um, you know, but that's enough. That's pretty much all I need. So it's kind of follow up to something uh, you said earlier. Um, you know, you're talking about furries bragging about their drinking habits on VR, and certainly that would go on at the cons when they were running. And, you know, my f roommate, until a couple of months ago, he was also a furry, and he was also a social drinker, and both of us said, the amount of drinking at the cons makes us uncomfortable to go, and it makes yeah. us uncomfortable to be there in the evenings. And mm -hmm. I found over the past 10 years, I'd say sometime between 2010, 2011, on till the pandemic, I was going to less and less and less furry cons because what I found is it was great until 7 o'clock. And uh. then it was like the purge. And you have people passed out in the hallways and you have people, I had people glomming on to me. They were in gorgeous fursuits. I'm like, we are both going to regret what's going to happen with what you want to do in the morning. So this is not happening with me. Um, all kinds of things. You know, I've been in elevators that just had the floor of a bar all over them because people would spill their drinks and just leave it. And my roommate was also a big social drinker, and he said, even I'm not comfortable with the level of it. And what I find mm -hmm. in VR chat is... When people are blackout drunk and they say, oh, my God, I just threw up, I can go go home, disconnect, go to another world. I can do any number of things where 
once I've booked the plane flight, booked the hotel room, I'm at the con and I'm stuck there until Monday morning or Sunday night or whatever it is, I go, now what do I do? I'm sitting in my hotel room on my computer on tapestries. I do that every night anyway. I didn't need to fly all the way out here. <laughs> And right. I just feel like, I don't know, since cons have said, we are not going to run any activities after 7 o'clock because the only thing people want to do is drink and dance. If you're not a drinker and you're not a dancer, cons get really boring after 7 o'clock. And it's great that people are, but is there some room at the cons for someone who is not a drinker or a dancer, or should we just do what I've done and stay home? <laughs> Uh, Lolly, can can other people hear what he said? Yeah, basically you're right, and and I'm seeing less and less late night programming at furry cons, which is upsetting because some of the late night programming they used to have at cons like FC was some of the best stuff. They'd have panels starting at midnight. Um, like the famous Dragon Art panel, where basically this this person who was a collector of Dragon Art would invite artists to come and show their latest work, um, you know, on projected on the big screen, and then people would discuss it, and it was hilariously fun. Um, but it was all it was an eighteen plus, you know, it was adults only panel. It's you know, and of course, FC once again FC had the night market. They actually had an adults-only convention within their convention in one giant room that ran uh, Saturday night. So essentially, you could hang out in there. And there were dealers, the same dealers in the dealer's rooms, except they were selling all their adult stuff. And there was a DJ and people, you know, basically trying on outfits, harnesses and stuff. It was great. But you've got a point, and there are some conventions where the party floors are a total disaster. You know, one of the advantages to having uh, the, to controlling the drinking, at least in the hotels, is the hotels are very, very strict about underage drinking. So you have people checking IDs um, and giving people wristbands. And people are supposed to watch out that the people getting the drinks have the wristbands, uh, whether or not that's done. But you're right. Someone gets drunk and leaves the party, no telling where they're going to show up. It becomes a real mess. Maybe there'll be a tipping point where the convention will say, whoa. We're only going to allow so many parties, so many drinking parties, and if you're going to drink, you've got to stay in that party or stay in that wing of the hotel. Um, because you're right. It is becoming a problem, and it, I hate it to see literally any time conventions start reducing programming, and I know how it happens because we had this problem with Califer, the convention that followed on after, after conference. Uh, they'd have these meetings, and programming is kind of a hassle. So it was like, well, we have panels, and the people that run the panels don't show up, and you know, uh, nobody suggests good panels, and we always ask people to suggest panels. It's really hard to get people who come to conventions to actually help with them, even if all it is is just give us an idea. Let us know what we want. The things we did at conference, almost all of them were suggestions from people. Um, so what, do, you know, what, hap what does the committee do? They go, okay, we're not going to have panels anymore. We're not going to have a, a con book anymore because that's too much of a problem. Uh, you know, we're not going to have a, a video screening room because we can't check all the copyright stuff. <sighs> If you're screening videos at a convention and you're not advertising what your program is on your website, 
You have to go to the room to see what's playing. Nobody is going to shut your convention down for copyright infringement. That's a myth. And I know because what I did for 30 years was run video screening rooms. So, yeah, have more programming. You know, drinking should not be the major reason people go to a furry con. I mean, yeah, you go to the go to uh, FC to the party floor in the Marriott. Unfortunately, the Marriott has tiny little rooms. Only the suites at the end are big enough to really have a party. And the entire floor is covered with plastic. It's like it's very off-putting just to go onto that floor. I know exactly what you're talking about. And it's like, I am, I do drink alcohol. I can't drink a lot of it anymore because of my heart medication. But I like it. It's cool. But I don't think getting drunk is cool. And certainly, I'm not going to go drinking around people who shouldn't be drinking. But yeah, I mean, if there's anybody out there who's running conventions, do more late night programming besides the dance. Uh, it might be hard to get it started, but you'll probably find some people who, who will want to do stuff. Very good, very good question. All right. Uh, yeah, just one more question here from the Q&A, and then afterwards, anyone here in the room, if you have any follow-up questions or questions to ask. Oh, oh, th th that's, that's the last, that was the last question. So anyone, anyone here, okay. anyone here... That has um, any follow-up questions or if questions you have a for... question or if you had a friend that had a question that couldn't make it or is whispering in your ear or typing you on discord just i'll take that too <laughs> are you free to you're free to wrap up silas for the stream okay well, thank you very much for attending. Uh, I don't know how many instance rooms there were. If you were in those rooms, thank you very much for listening to me ramble on. Uh, thank you, people on the Discord. Um, this has been a wonderful convention. It's been one of the most fun conventions I've been to since I went to conventions, including the live ones. Uh, I've had so much fun and made so many more friends. Uh, had some great conversations. So get out there, have fun for the rest of the time the convention's going on. And thank you very much for, if you were listening to me, for listening to me. And I'll do it again at uh, the next Ferality. And maybe you'll run into me at a live con. So stay furry. <laughs>